So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. Happy Friday. I'm so glad you joined us for today's fireside fire drill chat. And you know, right around the time that I moved to Washington DC for four months to hold the fire drill Fridays rallies, millions of young people all around the world and many of your countries too, were marching and protesting the climate crisis. And Greta Thunberg was urging people to leave their comfort zones and start behaving the way you're supposed to behave when you're in a crisis. I was really impressed by the passion, creativity, and unprecedented size of these global protests, the largest climate protests ever. But to tell you the truth, I had never met a young climate activist or heard their stories, and when I did, broke my heart. You know, there was Abigail Leedy, who's an 18 year old organizer from Philadelphia. She's a white girl and a working class part of Philadelphia. She's with the sunshine, the sunrise movement. She told the crowd at a fire drill Friday rally in her hometown of Philadelphia that summers now are the hottest on record that temperatures were so high that the school district didn't think it was safe for students to be inside the unair conditioned brick buildings. So they were sent home where it was even hotter, just like the schools, but even hotter than the schools because they couldn't afford air conditioning. She said that in Philly, over a hundred people had died in the last 10 years during those heat waves. She told us that Philly has one of the largest oil refineries in the East, situated in a densely populated poor neighborhood where large numbers of children suffer from asthma. Well, that, that refinery exploded in 2016, raining down 5,000 pounds of hydrofluoric acid into homes of South Philadelphia. Abigail said, quote, in Philly, people die because of fossil fuels, because we don't have nurses in public schools because they're, they're poor. Young people are born poor, they stay poor, and maybe die later from a heat wave or a fossil fuel explosion that they had no role in creating. I never made it to college, she said, because the world's on fire and I have to fight against the climate crisis because I can't stop dreaming about what it would be like to grow up and grow old under a Green New Deal. And then she said, under the Green New Deal, maybe we wouldn't be poor. She was just, she was heartbreaking. And I also realized how the Green New Deal offers so many young people something to go on living for, something to hope and dream for. And there was, there was another young speaker, Yvette Arellano. She's a Hispanic activist in Houston, Texas. The high school she attended is surrounded by a massive petrochemical infrastructure. And living all her life in this neighborhood, Yvette didn't even know that all children don't grow up smelling benzene, that all young sports players on the fields don't have to constantly stop to use inhalators because of their asthma. She thought all little kids spent parts of their summers locked indoors in 115 degree heat, windows covered by plastic without air conditioning until the latest chemical disaster was over. You know, for a lot of us, sheltering in place was new, but not for kids like Yvette. So many in her neighborhood suffered from heart disease and cancer and respiratory diseases. And so Yvette is devoting her life to fighting against the fossil fuel industry that's causing environmental destruction and death. These are just two examples of young people with deferred dreams and a lot of heartache because they feel an obligation to confront the climate emergency. You see, I wanted to tell you these stories in case you thought that the effects of the climate crisis were something only felt in faraway countries. No, these crisis situations in Houston and South Pennsylvania exist all around this country in low-income communities, in communities of color, 
and on indigenous lands. And when we talk about environmental justice, what we mean is addressing the conditions in these communities first and foremost. My heart breaks when I sense the grieving in young people. Grieving what's already lost and what will be lost if we don't act quickly. Grieving because they literally don't know if their future will sustain life as we know it. Women from West Virginia who came to DC told me that young people in those valleys in West Virginia often suffer from PTSD following floods that sweep through their town. Writer and healer Dina Metzger has described what she calls the rise in extinction illness, attention deficit disorder, autism, rising suicide rates, or suicide ideation and depression in young people, and a new syndrome that's developing, which Metzger calls resignation syndrome. I don't think most of us are aware of the extent to which the climate crisis is having an impact on the mental health of our young and the depth of the passion and commitment and intelligence of these young climate activists as they address this crisis and how essential it is to stand with them in this fight for their future, which they had no role in creating. I want you to meet one of these climate activists, one of the leading climate activists. But before I introduce her, it's time for our good climate news. Sure, we need some of that right now, all the good news we can get. This is really nice news. I love Ireland. And today the good news comes from Ireland, where a newly formed coalition government has just signed a new proposed climate policy that would end fossil fuel extraction and keep it in the ground. Wow. This program of government called Our Shared Future was signed by the leaders of all three parties in the coalition, and it will now need to be ratified by party members. But it's looking promising that it will pass, and this would make Ireland the single most progressive country in the world when it comes to tackling climate change by going after the biggest cause, the fossil fuel industry. Some of the proposed measures include banning the sale of diesel and petrol cars by 2030, ending the issuance of any new licenses for exploration and production of gas, <clears throat> banning the importation of fracked gas, most notably from the United States, effectively canceling the construction of liquefied natural gas import terminals by denying them funding and political support. Also, requiring financial institutions to assess the risks associated with their exposure to fossil fuels and publishing a just transition. This is, this is truly remarkable. Ireland, we are rooting for you. Let's get this thing ratified. And next year, let's do the same thing in the United States. Now, on that uplifting note, please help me welcome today's guest, 18-year-old Jamie Margolin, co-founder of Zero Hour, one of the organizations that helped build the 2018 and 2019 global climate protests. She, along with 12 other young people, sued the state of Washington for contributing to the climate crisis. She's testified before Congress and has just released her book, Youth to Power, Your Voice and How to Use It. And I just bought five copies for my grandkids and myself. And by the way, the book has a foreword by Greta Thunberg. And last year, Jamie was recognized by the NNC as one of the 100 most influential women. And in 2018, was listed in Teen Vogue's 20 Under 20. And just this week, Jamie was named one of the top 20 under 20 LGBTQ activists to watch by Teen Vogue and GLAAD. So, a warm congratulations to you, Jamie, for that honor, and welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Thank it's great so to have you. Thanks for taking the time. Can you start off by telling us how you became a climate activist? 
Yeah, so I really got into climate justice work because, I mean, I can't remember a time in my life where this wasn't an issue that was always on my mind. Um, I grew up and I'm still living in the Pacific Northwest where, you know, you can see a lot of the destruction um, of the natural environment and there's a lot of like new fossil fuel infrastructure being built and ever since I was little um, I've always known about the climate crisis that's always been looming over um, my life and the life of you know everyone in my generation but I just I didn't know how to act because no one had given me a guide or any sort of thing of like how to take action um, on an issue and so I you know, I really wanted to take action like back in second grade when I was really, you know, I really learned about this, but I ended up not officially starting to be a real organizer until I was 14. And I started organizing locally in my democratic campaign headquarters doing electoral work um, and just being like a campaign intern and trying to do everything I can to like get out the vote that way. But then, um, you know, once the 2016 election didn't go the way that I had planned, um, then I moved more into issue-based uh, organizing and I started organizing around the environment and around climate justice um, in my city of Seattle. And so then from there, I just started organizing a lot. I think climate justice is something that has been, you know, in my bones because of where I come from, like in the Pacific Northwest, there's just so much beauty that is being destroyed. But also um, on my mom's side, my mom is from Colombia, South America, and I'm very connected to like my family there and everything like that. And they would be sending in the family WhatsApp group chat, like photos of fish washed up in the rivers because the fracking was so bad that um, the fracking was so bad that, that all the fish died. And then there's also a lot, they talk a lot about the Amazon rainforest deforestation and my abuela, my grandma, um, she grew up for the most, for her, the first part of her life um, living off the land in Colombia and then you know, she moved to the city but um, my grandma my abuela she has this intrinsic connection with like nature and the land um, that she kind of passed down to me and my family so it's just always been something like in my bones that you know you have to respect the earth um, and because my grandma that's how she lived for um, that's how my abuela lived for the, the first part of her life. Um, she gave to the earth and the earth gave back and there wasn't any chemicals or pesticides or anything. It was just her and her family like living off the land in a sustainable way. Um, and then, you know, that's not happening anymore. And so it's just really in my blood, I, I think, is, is caring about the living things around me. Mm -hmm. You know, the research shows that Latinx people care the most about the climate. Not, not only in the United States, but all around the world. Do you, so maybe that blood in you has, has helped. <laughs> maybe people. a little bit, maybe. Yeah. So you, you to, you've told me that when Trump was elected in 2016, you were really depressed. <laughs> I was Very right much. there. I dealt with my depression by going to Standing Rock to oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline and support the water protectors. What did you do to overcome your depression? Well, you know, it was around that time, for a while I just wallowed in it. I was also a 14 year old girl, so I was going through my angsty phase and I was just like, everything is so horrible and I hate everything, you know? So there was a lot of wallowing and like, you know, involved, um, but, but it was also kind of, I eventually channeled it into, I was actually just learning about Standing Rock at that time and I didn't have quite an understanding and I wasn't like quite on social media yet where a lot of information was coming. Um, but I watched a documentary called Awake, A Dream from Standing Rock about the Standing Rock protests a little later um, and learned about a lot of the indigenous young people, especially indigenous young women who are just putting their bodies on the line and just being absolute heroes on the front lines, defending their land. Um, and I was so inspired by them that I was like, okay, uh, if they can do it, if, if they can put their bodies on the line and, and do all of this work, then like, why am I just sitting here doing nothing? And so it really pushed me to, to really do that work. And I eventually, uh, a lot of the young people, you know, in that documentary and in other videos I watched, um, my heroes became Tokata Iron Eyes and Jacelyn Charger, who were the... Um, yeah two young women uh, leaders. And, you know, if I was admiring them from afar, but eventually they started like, you know, they did several events with Zero Hour. And so I was able to like connect with them and now actually befriend them, which was really amazing to like, you know, meet your heroes and be able to work with your heroes. So um, Standing Rock was definitely something that really inspired me and pushed me and the women who, who, who the young women who led Standing Rock and, and were a big part of making that happen are, you know, my heroes to this day that I really admire and look up to. And I 
I think are, are truly amazing. Um, but yeah, I dealt with it doing community organizing eventually. I wallowed for like a month, but then I got to work. I keep saying activism is the perfect antidote to despair and depression, right? It really is. Yeah, activism, acting is the antidote to depression. Because if you're so busy taking action on something, then you're not, you know, you're not going to sit there in existential dread and you have something productive to channel all that rage into. Yeah. So w why did you call the organization you co-founded Zero Hour? What does that mean? So zero hour is called zero hour because we have zero hours left to act on the climate crisis. I remember that when we were first starting the organization back, so zero hour started um, the summer of 2017. I started organizing around the summer of 2016. And so it was like a year after um, I really began doing the work. Um, I got a taste for what it was like for politicians to just screw you over and lie and pretend that they're going to take action and not. And after working so hard and burning myself out, I got a taste for also activism burnout. I got a taste of just all of these things. And it was just so frustrating. And I wasn't seeing this outrage around the climate crisis um, in the mainstream, like I thought there should be, um, at least not to the extent that it needed to be. And so when I, I posted on my social media that I wanted to start a youth climate march uh, and I asked who was with me and I got a few responses from a few young people around the country. And we were also part of the reason, you know, is I was very inspired also by Standing Rock and after watching that documentary and seeing how these like, young women were just taking control and, and taking incredible action. I was like, I was inspired by them to do um, this work. And so I posted about that, I got a few responses, and when we were coming together with the organization and what we were going to do to organize the marches, we wanted it to be something urgent, like an alarm. You know, if you notice, if you go to Zero Hour's website, this is zerohour.org, our coloring isn't like green and blue, our branding isn't like typical environmental colors, it's very, it's red and bright orange and it's emergency alert, and so we wanted it to be something unconventional and something a bit more urgent for people. So it's not, we didn't want it to be a happy-go-lucky, we're kids who like the earth, like kind of greenwashed thing. We wanted people to know that we're serious. And so zero hour was something that was unusual and in people's faces and showed like, we're not messing. And, and our red branding um, is like, we're not here to here to play with anyone. We're not here to, um, we're, we're here, we're serious. Um, and also Z stands for generation Z, um, which is my generation is generation Z. And so that was also a play of the Z. And also Z is the last letter of the alphabet. Um, and we are potentially, you know, the last generation that can do something about this. So it was a very meaningful and symbolic name. Yeah, you've, you've got a lot in common with, with Greta. I guess you know that. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Uh, tell me, where did the idea come from to sue the state of Washington? Well, the idea to sue the state of Washington came from, it was actually, there's an organization called Our Children's Trust that has been um, organizing and mobilizing. Um, they've been, they have a team of lawyers that helps young people sue governments uh, over denying young people our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So the whole concept of Our Children's Trust and all of their lawsuits is that um, we have constitutional rights uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and those are considered inalienable rights. Um, and you can't have clean air, you can't have a life, liberty, and happiness without clean air, clean water, and a livable future. And so, um, that's that's something that a lot of governments actually pretty much all governments are denying by continuing to knowingly make the climate crisis worse and something that is being argued in every single one of the lawsuits that our children's trust is helping young people wage is that this isn't like a oops sorry kind of accident thing a lot of these corporations um, a lot of these corporations knew what they were doing um they, a lot of governments knew the dangers of climate change. They knew they knew what was going to happen, and yet because it was so profitable, or because they were in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry, they continued and continued with this destruction. And so, um, the, these lawsuits are pretty much holding them accountable and saying that they're actually governments are denying young people's constitutional rights. And so the one in the Washington state, initially it started out as an ex a hand of friendship to the Washington state government. It was like, a, oh, we wanna work with you, you know, cause Washington state is continued, considered a very environmentally friendly um, place. And 
it went back and forth and back and forth and eventually it turned into a constitutional offensive lawsuit where we were now like okay you the department of ecology was pretty much you know trying to get out of their responsibilities and things like that and it was just a tug a push and pull and eventually it was like you know what we're suing you this is not okay why are you denying action we don't have time for this and so Right now, the lawsuit is still happening, um, but we are what we are suing for. What we are suing for is a um, climate recovery plan. So, a court mandated climate recovery plan that would be instituted that would make sure um, governments would have to take action on the climate crisis, and it would be illegal for them not to. And that's what we're trying to prove in court. Um, so, this is something that that is still happening in Washington State, and I'll keep everyone updated about how that goes. Yeah. But it's yeah. Great. So, so let's talk about your book, Youth to Power, and why you wrote it. Here it is. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I wrote a book called Youth to Power. Um, I'm so happy that you uh, got copies for yourself and your grandkids. I really hope that they enjoy it. Um, so what this is, is it's a guide to being a young organizer for any cause. And it's not, you know, I, I can't claim to know everything. I'm just 18. I'm on, honestly very early on in, um, in my life and learning and knowing things. But I got so many emails and DMs and questions from young people of like, how do I um, get involved? How do I start an organization or join an organization? Or what do I do? I want to, I, I care about this issue. How do I take action on it? And I would try do, to do my best to respond to messages, but there's only so much you can communicate across like Instagram DM. And so eventually I kept responding and responding and responding. And I was like, wait a minute, um, I should just immortalize this information in the form of a book. And this was also I said earlier that I had wanted to take climate action and take action on different issues since like I was in second grade, but I had no idea how because there was no guide and there was nothing for me that was like a clear and cut everything in one place, like one book that would have been super helpful. And so this book, Youth to Power, is a gift to my younger self. It's what I would have given my younger self um, when I was first starting to get involved. And pretty much what it is, it each chapter talks about a different um, I guess, aspect of organizing. So there's one about relationship building. There's one about um, nonviolence and, and stuff like that. There's one about direct action. There's one about um, social media strategy and on and on. And after each chapter, there is an interview with a young organizer um, from a different cause. And so there are LGBT organizers and Black Lives Matter organizers and environmental justice organizers. And for pretty much as many causes as I could fit, uh, talking about their experiences because I'm just one girl with one um, outlook and there are so many different outlooks. So I try to include as many organizers in here as well as highlighting their stories because I think everyone should know their names. And it was really great because I got to interview Tokata Iron Eyes in this book. Uh, and she got to share her wisdom in these pages, which was really meant so much to me because she was one of the people that inspired me to even start being an organizer and doing this work in the first place because of all that she's done in Standing Rock. So I look up to her so much and for her to agree to share her story in the book was just truly mm -hmm. amazing. And I'm so grateful to all of these young people in here. So yeah, that's the book. And it just serves as a little guide to get started um, in organizing and creating change. And I also talk a lot about mistakes that I've made in the past. So you get to learn from my mistakes and not repeat them. So, yeah. I can't wait to read it. Sounds fantastic. Thank you for writing that. Thank wow. you so much. Now, let, let me ask you something else. I, you know, I know that many people were deeply disappointed when Bernie didn't become the Democratic presidential nominee. Right. And I know that Joe Biden, may not be their number one choice. But one thing that I'm sure of, Biden can be moved, he can be persuaded, which is why working to make sure that there are unprecedented numbers of people pressuring him in the streets, shutting down the government if necessary, demanding the big bold moves that a president can do through executive order right from day one without waiting for Congress. You know, stop fossil fuel subsidies, end all permits for new fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuel exports, make polluters pay, shift financial flows from fossil right. fuels to climate solutions, rejoin the climate agreement, to just to name a few. If elected, he could do these things in the first 10 days and we can pressure him to make sure that he, that he does. And we're gonna need all of the young activists with us. So, I mean, what, what do you think? Even though they were 
Bernie do or die, the pressure can cause this guy, Joe Biden, to do what's right. Will you be with, will, will, do you think that young climate activists will, will come out and do that? I think, you know, I, I, have, I have several different answers to that question. I think first things first, um, you know, one thing I am very quite nervous about is even let's say that even if, you know, Joe Biden gets elected, I think a lot of people might go back to like, okay, it's great. We have a Democrat, like, let's go. But no, like we need to keep the pressure and we, we need to pressure, keep the pressure um, and keep advocating because it's not as black and white as Democrat good, Republican bad. Like both Democrats and Republicans have so much to uh, so many mistakes to that they need to correct it and so much to do on the climate crisis. And so we cannot just be complacent if he, you know, if he gets elected, we can't be like, oh, well, that's a relief. Trump's out. Peace out. No, we have to keep, um, we have to keep the pressure um, and we have to increase the pressure and demand a change um, and, and, and almost like drag it out of them. Um, so I will definitely be demanding that change and I'm not going to go easy on him at all. Um, I think, I think one thing is, I guess, for people to know a little bit about me, I uh, was a surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and I'm currently, I think, pretty sure I'm the youngest delegate um, who is going to be, um, I'm going to be casting my vote in the Democratic Convention for Bernie Sanders. So I'm a delegate for Bernie, as well as I was a surrogate for Bernie. So I am very much a Bernie girl, very much for um, most, you know, what he advocates for. Um, but I think, you know, people are are wondering, oh, how are we going to get the young people to, to vote for Biden? How are we going to, I think what I, what people need to understand is like, I've seen a lot of, you know, shaming people of like, oh, you're dooming the country if you don't vote for Biden. Um, but I think shaming is not a good uh, turnout, get out the vote tactic. And so if you want to try to get people on your, on your side and get folks, you know, you have to understand where, where we're coming from and how for a lot of people, Bernie Sanders was the compromise in terms of what communities need and what are advocating for like Bernie was the compromise and so you can't just go up to because a lot of communities also have been harmed by um, his past actions and, and policies and things like that so you can't go up to a community or someone who has been uh, hurt by any a certain action or something by Joe Biden and things that he supported and just say you have to vote for him or else you're a terrible person you have to offer someone something to vote for and so I think this is part of the reason why I am a delegate at the convention and I'm going to be pushing you know for the progressive platform is that if you want people to turn out and vote for Biden you have to give them something to vote for you you can't he's not trump like i like most people in this world are not trump like not being trump is is not exactly like that that's not going to be enough we have to make sure that we give people something to vote for give the young people something to get excited about um because vote for him or else you get another uh term with trump is not going to be enough to to push people to turn out the vote you need to give something to be hopeful for and not mm -hmm. just something to vote against otherwise and you also have to be careful you know and, and be compassionate with communities and like why well why were you with bernie like of course like how how were you harmed by certain past actions and, and be compassionate and um, make sure that that there's going to be remedies for things that, that we're going to move forward to a brighter future um and not just simply um, try and, you know, just say you have to, um, cause that's not going to be effective at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I, listening to you, I can't help but think of the black women in Alabama. Do they love Doug Jones? No, but, but they're pragmatic. That's what's so great about the African American voters. They're pragmatic. Was it better to have Doug Jones or a pedophile, the other guy? Number one, number two, they wanted to show the power of the black vote. And they were largely behind the organizing and the voting. That and also, um, a, you know, the organizers that went into prisons and registered black voters there. Um, and so, we got something that really made a difference. Is he a massive progressive? No, but they knew what the alternative meant and they knew that they wanted to show and needed to show their power as a voting block. So I just have to take my hats off to the pragmatism of black voters. Let, now, let, let me go to the coronavirus. What are the lessons do you think we can learn from the coronavirus that can be applied to the climate crisis? I think one lesson that we can learn from the coronavirus is that there will be people 
who are just I, okay i i'm gonna i can't put this lightly in any other way but there are going to be people who are, are full of crap on any issue you know they're going to be deniers for any issue i think first things first is we have to see the pattern of what's been going on uh, with the coronavirus and uh, what's been going on with the climate crisis and the stages of denial and the stages of inaction uh this is i'm going to lay it out for people both for the coronavirus and for climate change so i'm talking about both step one you realize that there's an issue that could really hurt and kill people, but would potentially affect your pocketbooks and your wallet and the status quo. So what do leaders do? Deny, 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 ignore, ignore, ignore. That's what's been happening with the climate crisis and with coronavirus. Step two, now a bunch of people are dying and it's getting really bad and they're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting until it gets horrible and horrible. And then finally, okay, fine, we'll quarantine once it's already spread and gotten too late. Okay, fine, we'll take a little climate action once it's already gotten worse. And then um, you know, even at those stages of such a severity of something as undeniable as the coronavirus, there are still people who are like, quickly, uh, let's, okay, that was enough quarantining, let's, even if it doesn't solve the issue, because people are just so eager to protect, and by people, I mean the people in power, are just so eager to protect their pocketbooks and their wallets and not eager to protect the people, um, who are being killed by the coronavirus and who are being killed by the climate crisis. Um, I guess both another thing that we're seeing both with the coronavirus and with the climate crisis is truly how, how um, politicians are, are willing to, I guess it's both exposed how they see a lot of people in power see people. Um, I think there was like a viral moment where um, someone said capital human stock or something when referring to workers, pretty much referring to humans as like just a cog in, uh, they were like, our capital human stock or something is gonna get back to work. I forget the exact phrase, but it was something horrifying and dehumanizing. And then there was that whole thing of like, um, okay, everyone sacrifice your grandma and get back to work immediately. Remember that thing where everyone was like, it's time to die for the economy now, go. And, um, everyone was just trying to appease the, the line of the, it was cult-like, it's like a death cult of just trying to appease the line of the stock market. Like we must sacrifice all for the line. And I saw a bunch of funny tweets about that because it was just so real. Like both with the climate crisis and with the coronavirus, we're seeing how much um, corporations and governments are willing to sacrifice human life to appease the vague concept of the economy that isn't even currently working for most people. Um, and so when both of them, we're seeing how they'll, they'll gladly um, allow people to die to save money. That is both what's happening with the climate crisis. They're allowing the entire ecosystem and life on earth to die so that some shareholders can be happy for now. Uh, and they're allowing people to die of this virus so that some shareholders can be happy for now. Um, and it's also we're seeing with the, both of the coronavirus and the climate crisis, we're seeing the, um, I guess, dehumanization or just kind of accepting casualties as something like our government is like, okay, uh, Trump has said for a long time, like, oh, we're doing great. We're doing great. Even though over 100,000 people have died of the coronavirus, my grandpa being one of them. And so for someone who has lost a family member to this virus, anyone who's lost someone, they're not just a number that it's like, well, it could have been more like it's our family. And so, and that's the same that's happening with the climate crisis. It's like, you know, a lot of a lot of companies are just being like, well, you know, just treating people like numbers and math. And it's just dehumanizing and gross. And so you see, so what can we learn from this? Well, I think we can learn is A, stop wasting our time on deniers. Because if you can't even convince someone that the coronavirus is real, you're not going to be able to convince them that the climate crisis is real. And there will always be people full of crap on different issues. Two, um, this is this all gets to the root of corporate greed. And so we really need to rise up against these corporations and governments and leaders who are willing to, it's the same leaders who are willing to um, let people die of the coronavirus or the same people who are letting to, willing to let people die of the climate crisis. They don't care about you, they just want their paycheck. And so we have to get those people out of office and we have to completely transform a system. Thank you. Um, how do we continue to organize and get a politician's attention, though, in the middle of the pandemic? 
Um, I think the way that we can get politicians' attention right now, I think we can do strategic uh, cyber lobbying, I think is something that can really work. So for example, um, Twitter is something that most politicians are on right now, and it, it has a great format for a lot of people can say the same thing and tag someone. So let's say, for example, um, I don't know, you, there's a pipeline being built and, and you want it to stop. Um, and there's a politician who could make a call on that. You could get a group of people together and tweet like at politician, um, uh, please stop um, the pipeline um, or, or whatever demands you have or like, and this is what we demand from you, you can link to something. And then if a bunch of people start tweeting them with the hashtag and then that hashtag starts trending like, hashtag no decode access pipeline like that was trending and you and you put the there's a way to put digital public pressure on a politician if you can't physically congregate outside of their office because that's not safe you can put digital pressure on them and in today's digital age like digital pressure is something that is now taken seriously it's not just you know if you make it so it's not just a couple trolls on twitter but it's like a bunch of people coming together with the same message then that's a way that you can continue to like lobby even in the age of the coronavirus yeah, so the, the, the principle of us getting together, it's the large numbers, whether it's si digital or in person, exactly. unity and community and togetherness still remains the key ingredient, yeah. 100%. So my, my last question before we get to audience questions, you know, it's still Pride Month. And as we heard on our last show last week, the fight for queer rights and climate are fundamentally intertwined and I'd like you to talk about the intersection if you can. Yeah, so a, a lot of people don't understand the intersectionality between social justice and climate justice and especially talking about LGBT issues. Um, I'll just put it this way. Uh, I was lucky to, when I came out of the closet, be in a family that is very accepting of me and you know, I wasn't kicked out or anything and my family is very accepting of who I am. So me coming out was not dangerous. Um, but for a lot of other youth, they don't have the same experience. They come out of the closet and they potentially get kicked out of the house. That's why there are such high levels. If you look at the levels of youth homelessness, a huge chunk of, of the population of folks who are homeless are LGBTQ, whether that's because of family, being cut off from your family and, and money and stuff like that, or just discrimination in general that makes it harder to uh, work and, and sustain yourself and all of that. Um, and with the climate crisis, um, homeless folks are going to feel the worst effects of, for example, let's say there's a wildfire and this, the air is unhealthy to breathe. If you have a house you can hunker down in and shelter in and you can have air filters and stuff like that, then you're going to be okay. Climate change has also caused very extreme cold temperatures like the polar vortex um, that is deadly for someone to be outside in a polar vortex. If you can shelter in, in your house and turn on the heat, you're going to be fine. But what happens if you're not? What happens if you're going to be out exposed to the elements? And the weather keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse, um, not just the weather, but the climate um, and these conditions and these storms keep getting worse, then the people who are homeless are gonna be on the front lines and feeling the worst effects of this and being exposed to the elements. Now, who is disproportionately likely to be homeless? LGBTQ people, especially LGBTQ youth. So we're seeing how the discrimination against being queer, especially even within family units, is directly putting someone on the front lines of danger um, to feel the worst effects of the climate crisis. And so that's just one, there are many other intersections and, and examples, but that's just one example of how um, social justice and climate justice around this specific issue link. Um, so you can't, the climate crisis is not existing in a vacuum separate from all other issues. It's not like you have the climate crisis here and then all other social issues here. The climate crisis is something caused by people. Um, and it's, it's a result of a lot of systems. So at the root of the climate crisis are systems of oppression. And um, the climate crisis is intertwined with everything happening in our world because it is our world. So uh, whatever social justice issue you can think of, it's probably being impacted by the climate crisis. Yeah. Thank you for that answer. And um, so it's time to ask for questions from, from our audience. M Maddie, what, what questions do you have for Jamie? Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, from Lana on Twitter. Jamie, how has your identity played a role in your activism? Um, my identity has played a pretty big role in my activism. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have quite a uh, mixed background. So on my dad's side, my dad is an Ashkenazi uh, Jewish American person. So he's an American Jew. Um, 
And on my mom's side, my mom is an immigrant from Colombia, South America, and I am also um, quite openly gay. And so a lot of these different identities, um, I guess, impact the work that I do because I come at it from a lens where it's like, I can't, a lot of people, I've been in situations with people who hold a lot of privilege, um, who are just like, stop fighting for gay rights and all that stuff and just shut up and focus on climate change because that's more important. And it's like, I'm not gonna stop being gay or being Jewish or being a woman or all these things while we solve the climate crisis. Like, and that's why it's, it's so insulting when people say, stop fighting for social justice and focus on climate change. Or it's like, I am still gonna be facing all the things that I'm facing regardless as we're trying to solve this. And so I guess having these identities and having um, having these identities makes me more aware of how, I guess, of intersectionality and also how much, you know, you have to be fighting for social justice while you fight for climate justice. A, because they're the same thing. There is no separation between social justice and climate justice. That's not real. They are the same thing. B, because it's just like, even in my own life, like I'm gonna deal with issues that come up because of all these, and, I, and I've experienced pushback and harassment and stuff because of certain identities, especially a lot of anti-Semitism. Uh, Anti-Semitic folks are very active on social media. Um, and so I'm gonna keep experiencing these things while I fight for climate justice. And, and this goes for someone of, of, for anyone who has any marginalized identity, you know, we have to keep up the fight for racial justice while we fight for climate justice. And so I guess this has also made me a lot more open um, and I guess more of a compassionate person and more understanding of like what other people go through based on what I've been going through. And I think that, you know, that's how I guess my identities in a nutshell have been um, influencing my activism and my work. From Mary on Zoom, what can we do to activate more poor communities of color in the US and across the world? I think the question isn't how to activate those communities, but how to support the work that's already happening. I think, you know, we want to make sure that we, who, who is we, I, I guess, a lot of work is happening on the grassroots level in many, many uh, low income communities of color. And it's not that they don't need to be saved by anyone. It's more of like, highlighting the work that's being done and, and funding and giving resources and giving help. I think um, just because something is not in the news doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I realize that I hold a lot of privilege as someone who looks like me um, and of my skin color, like, you know, that that is going to lead people to, I guess, giving me more attention or, you know, um, but I think the the media focuses a lot on people who look like me. Um, but I think the work is is being done by a bunch of um, so many amazing like activists in those communities are already doing the work. So it's not like how can we go in and save them or how can we make them take work? It's more of, um, it's not how can we make them do work because it's already happening. We're just not noticing. It's more, do, let's actually pay attention now and see what we can do to help and not like try to intrude or assume that that work isn't being done. So I think it's, it's um, I would really recommend uh, looping in with like the Climate Justice Alliance and Uprose and other great climate justice organizations. And if you wanna plug into the work that's being done there, that's something that you could do, um, but also just donating resources to the work that's already being done on the ground. Great, and you touched on this just a little bit, um, but from Nina on Twitter, how can young people around the world get involved in climate activism or other types of activism? I mean, it's really about just doing what works best for you. There is no one way to be an activist. I feel like that word, the word activism, you know, like when I wrote Youth to Power, I think I, I started writing that like two years ago. So it was even before the word activist became so saturated and meant so many things. And I think it's often overused that it's almost lost meaning. But I guess what you can do to, 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 take, to make change in your community is it's really about it's not like there's one way to do this. It's not like you have to, um, I think there's a mis misconception that you have to be out in the streets raising your fist protesting and that's the only way to do it. When in reality, there are some people who protest, there are some people who make like the art that, that is behind me right now, like this is activist, activist art that inspires and helps tell stories. So if you're an artist, you can take action. And so I think the way that, that young people can can take action is really find whatever talents and skills you have, whether you're an artist, whether you are really um, a talented like at science or whatever it is, or whether you're good at organizing people or being in charge, whatever it is that is your talent, take that and channel it into a movement, um, whether it be an organization like Zero Hour um, or whether it be in your community. 
And so find a cause that really impacts you and that you care about, but then also find something that you love to do and you can tie them together. Um, and I guess, but then there's also another uh, cheap answer to that question, which is you can get the book Youth to Power. I, I had to, I'm sorry. I had to plug. Um, because that's why I wrote it. That's why I wrote it. It's because of those questions. It's literally the reason why this exists. Uh, I hate to be that person who's like, buy my book. But I'm, you know, um, you can go to www.youthtopowerbook.com to order the book, which answers all of those questions, not just from me, but from a bunch of other organizers who have different perspectives than me as well. So this answers that question, which is the whole reason why I wrote it while I wasn't paying attention in my classes in junior year. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Maddie, Thank are there you, other Jamie? Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. I, I hope we can fit them in in the time we have left. Um, so from Daniel on Zoom, uh, Jamie, I've heard you speak before about climate grief and climate anxiety. Can you explain this a bit more? Yeah, so climate anxiety is real. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, pretty much what climate anxiety is, is it's like the anxiety and grief and just feelings of depression and sadness that come from knowing that we're living in a world that is falling apart. Like there's, it's an existential dread almost. And it's especially worse with people who already have anxiety. So this is something that I'm quite open with. I'm kind of an open book with a lot of things, but um, I suffer from diagnosed uh, OCD, depression, and anxiety. So I'm already a quite depressed and anxious person just wired. I don't usually show it publicly, but like that is what I am most of the time. And so when you add the climate crisis in there, it's like it, it also can exacerbate um, existing anxiety because you have your own anxieties as a person. And if you're someone who has the condition that I have, then you also have that additional baggage. But then on top of that, there's just this existential dread of just I'm working and planning for my future that may or may not even exist is this even am I even going to um like like th there's also the the sadness and the anger of like you try to plan you try to dream you try to be happy but then there's this thing that is preventable but people in power are deciding to put money over people's lives there's this thing that is preventable that is could threaten everything that you love. And, and so much as so many people are dying, so much is being taken away from people. It's just this grief, it's this anguish about everything happening. And it's not just being sad about climate change, it's actually like a psycho, like a psychological like thing, like it's a phenomenon, like climate anxiety isn't just a couple people are sad about climate change, it's a, and it's an actual phenomenon. Well, a really good next question um, to that response, Jamie, is from Jackson on Facebook. How are you taking care of yourself now while still planning for the future and taking action? How do you balance both and what has worked for you and what hasn't? I have, uh, I really love like TV and movies and music. What I've been doing to take care of myself is I will just escape into different forms of media as much as I see um, fit. And I guess it just, it really helps me a lot. So what I do is whenever I'm feeling like I'm on the verge of burnout, you know, I'll binge watch a show or I'll, I'm that girl who always has headphones in and is, you know, walking down the street with headphones is just probably dangerous, but that's me. Um, and so I'm like, I always try to distract or feed myself with art. I really love all sorts of art, whether it be pretty visual art that I surround myself or music or books or movies or shows. Um, that's really what I've been doing to take care of myself, especially when quarantine where there's nothing I can really do, but like, either work on my computer or consume different forms of art and media. And that's what I've been doing. And, you know, I'm actually, um, you know, I'm going next, I just graduated high school and I am next year uh, or this fall, hopefully, I don't know what it's gonna be like with the virus, but I'm going to film school because I also, another thing that I've been doing for myself is also in my career and what I aspire to, you know, trying to do things that aren't necessarily related to climate change and find time to be me as a person because I've been put into a box for years ever since I was 15, 14 of just like the climate, the girl who takes action on climate change. And I am so much more than just that. And so I'm also going to, even in what I study and do with my life, also take time to just create art that I feel that I just want to make because it's beautiful, not because it's about climate change. Um, and so that's also what I've been doing uh, is, is preparing to, to, to study for something that might not be what people want from me or what people expect from me, but it's what I want to do um, because I would just be so sad if I didn't you know, take a shot at, at making art that I care about. 
Thanks, Jamie. Um, so Madeline on Zoom would like if you could talk a little bit more about the correlation between systemic racism and climate change. Yeah, okay, so the correlation of systemic racism and climate change, disclaimer, obviously I look like this, so I'm not someone who is on the receiving end of, of these issues. Um, so I am coming to this from a place of privilege, obviously, um, but just from, uh, just to generally break it down, um, the climate crisis is a direct result of colonialism and colonialism is racist. Uh, so the, the act of, a lot of people like to pinpoint the climate crisis as starting with the industrial revolution. And that's when like the physical fumes started going out and creating the greenhouse gas effect. But the actual origins for the mindset and systems that allowed us to cause the climate crisis started with colonization and colonialism, um, which was treating land and people as property um, as something to take and extract. And so um, if you see, then the climate crisis resulted out of racist extractive systems. And when that, that the origin of the climate crisis is racist. And so people are like, wait, how is the climate crisis racist? It's because of this, the molecules in the air, like the carbon itself isn't racist, but the people who control where those molecules go, the people who control where the um, emissions get put, the people who control the resources and the land and everything, those people are racist. So maybe the climate itself is obviously not racist, but the people who control it are. And if you just, it's not just a random liberal ideology of like, oh, um, of course, you know, they're trying to make climate change about race. No, this, this is literally scientifically, like most coal plants, um, most coal plants and fossil fuel infrastructure, they exist of people who are vulnerable at the intersection of racism and class discrimination. So if you, most people, um, it's because of this. You're not gonna see a pipeline built through like Bel Air or Beverly Hills because the people there are going to be rich and powerful enough to say no to that. But if you target, if corporations are, um, I don't want to say smart, but I guess they know what they're doing, where if they target people who are at the intersection of race discrimination and class discrimination, if they target people who are mostly poor and folks of color, then they can get away with um, extracting from those communities um, because that has what that's what government have been getting away with for centuries and centuries. And those systems is where the climate crisis emerges from. And so right now, for example, with everything going on with Black Lives Matter, there is the police systematic killing of black folks, but then there's also the systematic killing coming from uh, corporations who purposefully target majority black communities because there's a track record of targeting and extracting um, from these communities since the beginning of this country, since the beginning of colonization. Um, and it isn't just like, oh, they're polluting the air. That pollution is toxic and kills people. This pollution and these emissions cause cancer and kill people. It is a form of systematic killing and it's not accidental. Um, and so there are so many examples of environmental racism from Flint, Michigan to the Dakota Access Pipeline, which was actually supposed to be initially not built through an indigenous reservation, but then um, it was rerouted there. And they, cause they, they thought that they could get away with um, extracting from indigenous folks, which is what this country has done literally since day one. So I, that was kind of a little all over the place, but I just wanted to give a quick overview um, of environmental racism. And I encourage everyone uh, once we're done with this to go and research environmental racism, read articles about it, especially from people um, who are from the communities that are actually experiencing um, these issues because I do come from a privileged angle on this. So read from the communities and um, learn different stories and you can't address the climate crisis without tackling racism. Like climate justice and racial justice are literally the same thing. They are inseparable. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, Sigourney on Zoom asks, do you have any tips about talking to people in your life who aren't taking the climate crisis seriously? So if those people in your life are climate deniers, don't bother because like I said, like don't waste your breath on deniers. But if they're more like apathetic and they're more like, well, I don't know, maybe, then I think that there's, you can kind of have an angle there. I'd say the best thing that you can do is find something that they care about and go from that angle meet people with their when they're at do they have kids that they really care about talk to them from the angle of of of, of kids or is there like a specific animal species that they care about or their 
or um, an industry that they care about and like a lot or their job or whatever it is that like just find an angle that that you can kind of meet someone where they're at and then start there is really my tips for talking to people. So much. Uh, from Davey on Facebook. Jamie, what do you think are the next steps for climate action movements? The next steps for climate action movements right now, you know, I think a lot of people are just too used to seeing the big mobilizations and thinking that's all that's happening. We're still doing a lot of work. It's just the news isn't, the cameras aren't on us, but we're still doing the work. I think the next steps is now a lot of um, stuff around elections and, and democracy, you know, uh, Zero Hour has been endorsing candidates down ballot. So a lot of like local races that I think it's a really important that, you know, the climate movement rally around it. Uh, electing very progressive candidates down ballot in local communities where work can be done, as well as also funding um, community services and work like that and different communities taking action for themselves because electoralism is one way to go, but it's not the only way to make change. Um, and so I think that really what we need to do is be focusing on um, changing our government, passing legislation, um, funding projects and work in communities so that communities can you know start taking action themselves and also doing a lot of work protecting biodiversity like um bringing attention to and supporting the works of of, of people on the front lines like defending the amazon rainforest defending uh different um forests and natural landscapes that are not just crucial to the communities that live in them but are also crucial to saving the climate because uh biodiversity and um the natural world is you know we can't lose that and so a lot of working on protecting places like the Amazon rainforest as well. Does Zero Hour do anything about registering um, young voters? Yes, so we just launched a campaign called Vote For Our Future with the four. Um, if you guys wanna look it up, it's hashtag vote for our future on any social media site. Um, and we are launching a big campaign to register as many voters as possible. We're trying to drive up youth voter turnout a lot. And we're also educating people about different down ballot races that people might not know about and trying to also get people through there. So we are spending a lot of energy um, registering young voters and then educating people about different races happening. That's fantastic. Well, Jamie, you are, you are something. I'm so <laughs> impressed by you and so grateful to you and your intelligence and your activism and grateful to your family for embracing all that you are. Um, it's you. time to wrap up. I hope I get to see you in person. Thank, Thank you, you all at home for being here with us today. If you haven't already, please text Jane to 877-877. It's a quick and easy way for you to get updates and get alerted when we have opportunities for you to take action from home. And um, finally, I want to tell you that Fire Drill Fridays and Greenpeace is launching a massive, and you'll be interested in this too, Jamie, a massive electoral organizing program to ensure that we elect climate champions up and down the ballot, because down ballot races, as Jamie said, are so important. And we need your help. We're building some very large volunteer um, voter contact teams, including, you know, there's one group that will be texting, one group that will be calling, one group will be specifically reaching out to Latinx communities to register and get out the vote and more. And all of this can be done from the comfort of your home. So please head to firedrillfridays.com slash volunteer and sign up so our organizers can reach out to you and get you plugged in. I really hope you'll join us. See, we, we can't gather together, but this is how we'll win, is to have people like you volunteering and use our digital, digital pathways to make things happen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of each other, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this and all that you do. Um, so it was really great uh, talking to everyone, and the work continues. So let's let's okay. let's get to it. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so much. Have a good day.